Hey everyone, and welcome back. So today we're going to be reviewing Monster Sanctuary for the Nintendo Switch. Now, Monster Sanctuary was released on December 8th of 2020 for the Nintendo Switch. It has a regular sale price of $19.99. However, as of filming of this review, which is December 16th of 2020, there is currently a 10% sale on the game, bringing the price down to $17.99. Now, as usual, just before we get started on the review, don't forget that if you end up liking this video, please do hit that like button. It really does help out a lot. And at the same time, why not subscribe to the channel if you aren't already so that you can see more of my content. Now, Monster Sanctuary is ultimately a monster catching, training and battling game. However, it's blended with Metroidvania elements but at its heart, a lot of people are ultimately going to be comparing this game to that monster of a franchise that is Pokemon. Now, during this review, I will most likely be comparing a few times this game to certain elements of Pokemon, just as a reference point so that you understand what is the same and what is different. But I think it's important that we're going to review this game based on its own merits and not only what it does better, the same or different than Pokemon. So. Any comparisons during the video are solely to give you a basis of comparison and not just to say, okay, well, this is another Pokemon-like game. Because although its basis of monster catching does resemble the basis of Pokemon, there are quite a few differences and overall, this does become its own game pretty quickly once you get to playing it. So if we start with just what the base storyline of the game is, basically you live in the monster sanctuary. There have always been wild monsters around and people have been taming them for years. However, lately the champion monsters, which are sort of stronger monsters that appear sometimes, have been appearing in greater numbers. So the monster keepers, which are basically the people who train monsters, have to basically up their game and start dealing with these extra champions. Now, to get your adventure started, you are going to have to choose what is equivalent to a starter monster. Basically, each monster is going to have its own set of elemental abilities, but it's also going to affect the way that the monsters can actually unlock some secrets or some special areas of the map. Now, as I said, this game is not only a monster catching game, it is also a metroidvania. So each and every monster's ability will help you unlock new parts of the map. So collecting monsters in this case is not only for battling, it's also for adventuring. And what's really interesting is that although you do have a party of six monsters that share in the experience from battles, each and every monster you're going to catch and ultimately hatch will also be available for adventuring to uh, use their abilities to help you access those parts of the map, not only the six monsters that are in your team. Now, what is also singular about Monster Sanctuary is that all the battles are 3v3 monster battles. You can swap out any of the monsters at any time, but once a monster dies, that spot is sort of lost for the battle. So then you only have two monsters to work with. As long as you can swap your monster out before it dies, you will always have access to your three spots, however. The battles are pretty much carried out in an RPG turn-based style. However, what is special about the combat system is that there is what's called a combo meter. And as the monsters attack, every successful attack will contribute to that combo meter, meaning that the following monster will have a bonus to its attack damage. Basically, what this sets up is that you normally will always start the battle with your weakest monsters or the monsters that are less aligned with the weaknesses on the opponent's side. And you'll try to finish off the battle with your strongest monsters or the monsters that are best aligned against the weaknesses to basically get an even bigger boost to your overall attack. Now, I found that this distinction is really important because it actually added an extra level of depth to the battles that if we do compare it for a second to Pokemon, Pokemon actually doesn't have. Often in Pokemon, the secret to winning is basically power leveling your characters, setting up the proper weaknesses, and then just one-shotting the enemies. In Monster Sanctuary, it's all about comboing your abilities from one monster to the other and using them in the proper succession. Now, to add another dimension, 
You also have equipment for all your monsters. You basically can equip three accessories and one weapon. And basically you have to line it up based on what the statistics are of your monster. If your monster is more of a magical attack based monster, obviously you'll want to put items that boost his overall magic power. If your monster has more physical based abilities, you'll be focusing more on physical based damage. And lastly, as in every really good monster catching game, of course you can evolve your monsters. However, evolution in this case only lines up with getting the proper special evolution item and lining it up with the proper monster. If you go to a special area of the map, you will then have access to evolving your monster at any point during the game. And lastly, to add to the base mechanics, your character will also eventually get certain upgrades. You will find certain items which will unlock additional abilities as in any good Metroidvania, such as double jumping. Now that we have the base mechanics out of the way, the overall progression in the game is done by defeating, as we mentioned earlier, these champion monsters that are appearing. Because basically you'll have an overall trainer rank or keeper rank in this game, which will be associated to how many champions you've managed to defeat so far. So basically you have to adventure throughout the map, find the different champions, beat them, and as you defeat more champions, your rank will be boosted, giving you access to new parts and new areas of the map overall. Now, if this all seems like quite a bit for the base mechanics of the game, it's because it is. Monster Sanctuary is quite a fleshed out game for only $20. And actually, I'm not surprised. Being basically published by Team 17, you know that normally they'll only back games that are generally of pretty good quality for the price. And lengthwise, this game is not going to have the problem of some indie games of finishing too early because you've got at least 20 to 30 hours easily of adventuring, all depending on your level of ability to solve the puzzle solving over the map. Now, let's start with the critiques. And I want to start with some of the good points that Monster Sanctuary has going for it. And the first really good point overall is its overall exploration design. And the way Monster Sanctuary accomplishes this is really through overall quality of life upgrades. Basically, since they want to emphasize exploring the map, in between each monster battle, your whole party is fully regenerated, HP, MP-wise, movesets. There's no counters that force you to continuously come back to your home base to sort of rest your monsters up to go back out. What that means is that you can explore for as long as you want with sometimes never having to return to your base camp unless you really want to buy a specific item, upgrade a specific item, because these are all things you can also do in Monster Sanctuary. And since they went with an overall Metroidvania design, I found that this part of the game was the most refreshing element overall. Because when you think back to your days at Pokemon, you end up doing a lot of back and forth to your Pokemon Center, just basically resting your Pokemon between each battle, giving them potions, going to back, buying more potions, coming back on the map, and the overall progression in the game is actually very slow, because overall, the game is made to have you grind out levels and grind out your party. Now that, it's not bad, it's just an overall really difference in philosophy and design with this game. Where this game, the point is, don't stop exploring, keep going through the map and working your way around. And if you just keep battling, eventually you'll get the right monsters to unlock the special abilities you need to access new parts of the map. And eventually by accessing those parts, you'll beat champions. Once you beat those champions, you'll be able to access new parts of the map and so forth and so forth. Now the next thing that this game I find has going for it that is really, really positive is the overall graphical style of the game as well as the overall controls. Let's start with the controls. They're very crisp and very precise. What that means is all the Metroidvania sections that depend on very precise jumping never feel cheap because you weren't able to accomplish the jump because of the controls. If you didn't accomplish the jump, you just didn't do it right, not the game got the wrong input. And since a huge part of the game does require to do some pretty precise jumping and platforming, it's really good that they went with an overall very crisp and very, very tight design scheme. And if you look at the overall graphics, okay, these are sort of retro, I would say, 16-bit graphics. However, the overall map designs are still very, very vibrant. You have a lot of really, really great backgrounds in the game that give you some depth of field, basically, as you're adventuring through. 
and each zone is actually really really well designed as you will right away know when you're in one zone compared to another because the overall design is very different. You start out with a foresty zone, then you go into some caves, then you wind up in a dungeon, and finally you wind up in more of a swampy sort of in-between forest zone. But each of these zones feel very different and the overall design of the platforming sections really go along with each section and the visual support for that is very good. It's also very clear on the map where one zone starts and another ends because the whole map is color coded. So everything is very clear as you're adventuring to the game of where exactly you are in your adventure. So now that we know how the game plays out, what are some of its really good points are? Let's talk about a few of its weaker points, however. And the first of its weaker points is with its overall battle design, although it's refreshing the combo system they based on, some of the fights do eventually feel like they drag on a little bit too long. Because the sort of game was sort of made with preventing these one-hit kills in mind to differentiate itself from that other franchise, I do think that they went maybe a little bit too far in the other direction. Where basically some random battles do take like 7-8 turns to finish, even when it's the first time you're encountering a monster type. Which does seem to drag on and slow down the adventuring just a little too much in some sections of the game. Especially when your party of chosen monsters isn't well set equipped to deal with the weaknesses of the opponent's monsters. The battles can become extremely, extremely daunting and very, very long, although most of the time not that challenging, meaning that eventually you know you're going to win, it's just taking you 10, 15 turns to win that battle. Now don't get me wrong, it's not a bad battle system, I just think they went a little bit too far in the other direction and a better middle point could have maybe been found, you know, making the overall experience of the game flow a little better. And the second overall sort of weaker point of the game I would say is, in my opinion, the overall monster design. Because although there are maybe a few standouts, most of the monster designs I would say are forgettable. Meaning that whichever monster you're choosing for your party is rarely because you really like the monster, but more because you're just setting up basically your elemental versus magical versus physical weaknesses for the coming battles. I mean, this isn't a bad choice because as I said, they chose to, although you're collecting monsters, not focus as much on that one point. It is a little bit disappointing that the monster designs overall for most of them are forgettable. And also, some of the monster designs just feel like fillers, basically. Like, you know, you have your flying type, you have your electric type, you have your fire type. But the monster designs themselves is just like they threw one in because they needed a monster like that, but they didn't put too much thought into making the monster memorable in any way. Now, I'm not saying overall that the monster design in the game is bad. It's just not memorable. And when you know that this game is going to be compared to that other franchise, and that one of their staples is their uber memorable monsters that have people coming back for each sequel, just to meet up with that old friend once again. Well, you sort of need to put a little bit more effort to at least get like a dozen to two dozen of your monsters at a comparable level. Like I have the starter, which is the Fire Lion. And right now I can't even remember the name of that breed because it's okay, but it's not memorable like Charizard was, for example, when I played Pokemon Red, the original one back in the day. And especially if you're setting up this game to set up a new franchise and, you know, maybe sequels down the road, you sort of need to set up that muscle memory that will have people coming back to, like I said, play with those same classic monsters, you know, over and over again in future installments. Now, before we actually get to the rating on the game, I do want to leave with a final thought. In 2020, I find it's really brave of any game developer to come out with a monster catching breeding game simply because that other monster franchise is still out there and still rolling like a steam engine and you when you know your game's going to be compared to it it's almost a death sentence for a lot of game franchises but i do find that in this case moi rai really came out with a working formula for something different it just needs a little bit of fine tuning and they could have a serious serious franchise here to challenge that other juggernaut out there so now I think that leads us perfectly into the scoring section. 
and that maybe did set you up with a bit of a spoiler of where I'm going with my overall rating. Now this game is really going to get a definite pickup. I do think that anyone picking up this game that has the least interest in monster collecting, metroidvanias or RPGs is going to love this game. And overall, the $20 you're going to invest is way worth it compared to the 20 to 30 hours you're going to get of gameplay out of it. And overall, out of all the game I've reviewed so far, I really, really had to debate a lot whether I would give this game a hidden gem rating. And I would say that the only reason it didn't get it is because at the end of the game, I was feeling a little bit of the repetition and the burnout on the game. But I would say that was only in the last like two to three hours of gameplay when I was very, very close to the end. And in the end, as I said, I just didn't feel myself attached to any of the monsters in my party other than thinking that, hey, this guy's really tough. He's really good in battles. But I didn't really feel any attachment to those monsters. And that's what was clenching it for me for giving it that hidden gem. If, it, if they could have gotten a few monster designs that I would have really been like, oh man, I love this guy, they would have clenched that hidden gem rating. So that's pretty much it for my review of Monster Sanctuary. As I said earlier in the video, don't forget that if you did like the video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you aren't already, and please hit the notification bell so you know when all my videos come out. And as usual, I hope I'll see all of you in my next video.